Good morning. Monday morning. Cloudy out, cool out. 7th of June and as I say the 7th of June, I really can't believe that the 7th of June, a week has gone already, but you know it has. I've decided that this drawing from yesterday that I want to fill some of these borders in a bit more so that they are a bit more consistent with each other. I mean, not identical, but just consistent. So that... Or have more of that feeling of um, coherence, perhaps, in them. Because that... It just wasn't sitting right with me when I looked this morning. And that is part and parcel of art, creativity, I suppose, when you come back to something with fresh eyes or having had a chance to just sleep on something, then things that perhaps should have been apparent to begin with weren't. And it's nice to just review and have that different perspective on it so that I can decide what I do next. And me, the next thing is going to be adding just some elements to fill in. I'm not going to make it perfectly square because this one won't be. I'm not going to add to make this completely square. I still want that kind of um, imperfect edges here. But at the same time, that was a bit of a wonky line, but it's okay. That's the problem with me putting pencil lines, is I think, oh, I've got to go up to them. So I'm going to try and be the best I can to not do that. That was definitely a bit too close there, but that's okay. It is what it is, and I might just add some black there just to separate it. That's okay where that is. The bottom bit. Now, if I decide at a later point I really preferred the original version, I've scanned this in, so... I can always revert to that if necessary by redrawing digitally, which is always a possibility. So if I particularly like this, it means then I can use this again and again in um, different guises and forms or um, changing colours and so on. And in theory, if I do it in vector, I should be able to change the size of it as well without any weirdness happening to lines. I think that'll work. Didn't take much. These are basically, yeah, this one will need just a little bit here, I think. And perhaps just something here, maybe. Just to keep it. Yeah, I'm happier with that. I am almost happier with that. This does need that bit of uh, that here, I think, is a bit more needed. Just little bits just to help it settle in so it doesn't look like it's been just added on for the sake of it. But 
Yeah, that's that works, I think. And now I'm going to have to go over here and just adjust these now. Once I start going up to the line, that's it. I have to continue it doesn't look right to me that's the problem with doing lines where I'm concerned edges is that I will have this tendency to want to work up to them even if I haven't previously as soon as I put them in I think yeah oh, I've got to go there and I am Yeah, that's fine. There is still that um, asymmetry in the corners, which I'm going to leave. And that I'm quite happy with now. That looks, yeah, it, it, it seems to sit better with me. Right now I'm fiddling around with my brush, am I? Yeah, which one's that one? It's one. There's two. There we go. So brush, pencils, and I'll add this, and I'll try and chatter if i don't i'll just stop i'll just speed it all up um it is monday here and i do need to get to the um oh all kinds of black stuff in here my water's weird today i don't know why might have been dried Ink tents at the bottom of it because I emptied it out yesterday. Shouldn't be. I don't know. It's okay though. So I'm using the same colours that I did yesterday because that'll keep everything here fairly consistent. I'm using that word a lot today because my brain just doesn't want to work on the different words, I think. coherent perhaps. I put my pencils over here as well so that I don't keep on reaching across. <laughs> and all you get is my arm going in and out of focus. It's not good. It's not a good look, Angela. So um yeah. And yesterday worked out okay I didn't get I say I, I'm going out for a walk today and I just didn't because at lunchtime about midday I've been to um, a meeting kind of thing in the morning and afterwards I just I just couldn't keep my eyes open so I crashed for a bit and I hoped it wasn't going to be as long as it was but it was um, you know an hour and a half or so and by that time uh, it would have been well it wouldn't have been too late by the time I come around properly and was able to be in charge of a car um, it would have been too late to go where I feel safe walking at the moment it's not pushing me too far out of my um, anxiety bubble so I, I did spend some time with art I did um, I did a drawing for um, this but um, botanical watercolour sketching domestic of course I'm doing and um, I did it in a sketchbook which has got a fairly okay paper in it which I thought would take the watercolours it did but not in the way I'd like I still want these vibrant colours I think that's my um, my main problem I suppose so I let it dry because I know that if I've added more watercolour on top the paper would have started pulling it's one of my sea white old media ones which are the paper is treated so it can take a small amount of water but not in the areas and the amount I wanted to add I suppose and um, So I thought, okay, um, ink tents wouldn't be a good idea because I've already used water on the paper. So let's have a look at um, perhaps doing something with um, coloured pencils. So I got out the colour soft 
and I thought, oh, what colours do I use? Where's my colour chart? Don't know. So off I went and um, made another one. And then started to add colour to the drawing of this succulent I'd done. And then got myself into a right pickle and just wonder what on earth I'm doing. <laughs> Yet again, what am I doing? Why am I trying this? I did get better with the coloured pencil, in fairness. I did get more of what I like, I suppose. And um, But dear goodness, I, I really get myself into a right lava and state with um color generally it, especially if it's if it's abstract like this or you know whimsical and cute like my doodle worlds or you know um, some of the the coloring templates i do and that's okay because you know it can in my head to have the color as stylized i suppose as the drawings are works um it's when things are meant to be real that I get when I'm working from something that's real that I can get into a right pickle if I'm trying to put colours down so it looks something like it you know I see or view or and I put myself through this on a regular basis as I keep saying and you think I'd give up by now wouldn't you but oh no 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 I'm, I'm tenacious with this it seems and I'm thinking I need to do this because I need to prove to myself that perhaps I can do this and get it right. But oh, I'm getting nowhere fast. Um, not that there's any rush, but I just seem to think get frustration sets in as it all seems to go weird again. So it's sitting back, rethinking what I'd like to do, learn what I can from the course, take what I can, and basically try and move forward from it so that I, um, I perhaps gain new skills and new perspectives and a new way of perhaps looking or expressing myself in some ways. But then I keep coming back to things like this, which it's, I find it so difficult to settle on or to go, this is how I work, this is my style. And I think this is my, or my artistic voice. And I think all of this just shows an insecurity or a lack of confidence or an inability to see that what I do is good enough or is it, it's me and I know where this comes from and this may help others but it comes from childhood and I was brought up always being compared to siblings and being told that I was basically useless at lots of things, that I was stupid, even though the evidence of exam results, test results, schoolwork showed otherwise. That my art was completely rubbish compared to my older sister who had been to um, the art foundation courses and um, had dropped out each time more or less. That my brothers could do everything much better than I could. And whenever I did any drawing, and I used to love to sit and draw, whenever I could find any paper or pens in the house, which was not very often. When I did something that I was pleased with and 
dared to show it to somebody, they go, oh, yeah, well, that's okay, but so-and-so can do better, so-and-so does better than that. And it just, I think it just wore me down and destroyed me. Um, it destroyed my sense of belief in myself. You know, those days, I can remember um, my older sister had bought for me, gifted me, I think it was my 13th birthday, um, a rotary pen, a rapidograph, and it was an 035, 0.35. I remember it well to this day. And I still have a set of, of rapidograph pens here. In fact, I have, I've had several because I keep forgetting that I have them and they dry out and I can never get them resurrected again afterwards. And I used to like to, I, my brothers had 2018, um, which was brand new out at the time. And I was, I couldn't have that. I had to have Bunty or Jackie because I was told, oh, girls don't look at that. Well, girls do. And um, I used to read 2080 and I have particularly favourite characters, Judge Dredd, of course, but Strontium Dog was another favourite of mine. And I'm sure there were many others, but for the life of me, I can't remember them now because it's been so long since I had them. I might have a couple of 2000 AD annuals still here somewhere in the house, in the hoard. And um, a graphic novel, I think, or two of Judge Dredd from way back when. And of course the artwork was quite amazing for a lot of things. And I would spend time learning or observing these things, particularly but I, it wasn't so much people, it was the robots and machines that got me. And suddenly a link is made here, isn't it? And another link as well, um, which I may mention. And whenever I did something I was really, really chuffed with, I'd taken my time, it'd taken me hours to do, and I might show somebody. I was instantly put down. Oh, that's useless. That's rubbish. You shouldn't be doing that. Why are you bothering? And about the same time, um, I was coming to choose my subjects for my O-level exams. Exams we take at the year you're age 16, which either, either O-levels or at the time it was CSEs. Nowadays it's GCSEs of the exams at that age. And sometimes others like Welsh back and BTEX and things but um but I don't even know because I've been out of teaching for so long I've got no idea whether that is still the case so obviously teachers will tell you whether they think you're capable of doing their subject and my art teacher after a year of a year of drawing my hand with pencil every week every single week without variation because that's what used to happen back in the day apparently which is great if you can draw um you know hand you know you've got an interest in drawing hands and things and i didn't no doubt if i could have spent the time drawing robot hands or mechanical hands things might have been a bit different but that just wasn't allowed so um i really was bored and it wasn't just drawing hands it was just with hb pencils i mean for goodness sakes it was whatever pencils you had in your pencil case which at the time everybody except for those who were seriously into art i suppose or knew about such things had just ordinary HB or number two pencils as they're called in America, which are okay, but you know, they're not the best for adding shadows and contrast and so on. So anyway, this art teacher told me that there was absolutely no way I should consider doing art. There's no way he'd accept me, not even in his CSE class, because I was so useless at art. And that really 
put the nail on the head, you know, sort of like, oh, well, my family are right. They've been telling me I'm useless. And, um, right, okay, then, you know, I had no intention of taking art because my, I decided that it was going to, you know, I wanted to do music and sciences and Welsh. And, um, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge problem or issue really for me but it did destroy me at the same time but of course I still I would still draw but it was always in a kind of scientific or you know very diagrammatic kind of way because obviously in geography you have lots of diagrams and maps and science you do and diagrams and scientific, scientific illustrations are very stylized very simplified in many ways drawings and here's another connection being made by me about me and that carried on into university and I always enjoyed very much enjoyed drawing diagrams and particularly scientific observational diagrams, drawings of things like flowers and things you could see under the microscope or crystals that were formed or whatever that you needed to include in um, reports on field work or experiments. And I really used to enjoy that, the obs close observational skills and being able to cre create something that looked not photographic realistic but was a realistic representation in terms of size and proportion small details often no color allowed because it had to be black and white there's a pattern going on here isn't there so i never thought anything more of it you know as as a teacher science teacher for all those years um 28 years Obviously, I drew diagrams for lessons and so on. And I also had a partner in crime when I moved to the school I, I taught at for the last 27 years of teaching. So I did teach in one school for 27 years. Yep, that's right, 27 years. And um, sort of like there was, we, there's always things you that are political or and I mean political not in the sense of major politics but politics within an organization and personalities and interplays and things that sometimes are so either ridiculous or so awful something has to be done to break break the stress or just to point out how ridiculous it was um, in much the same way that um, cartoonists in daily papers do this where they point out things in a slightly different way perhaps to how um, it's being portrayed um, and so I used to do these these things and sometimes they were like huge huge drawings and, and stories and, and so on and very you know sort of like how they I still to this day wonder how I didn't end up getting told off and because these to be put in the staff room I frequented and people would have seen them and sometimes they used to disappear but I never put the originals up it was always um, a photocopy and the um, the women who worked in the photocopying room were very very um, supportive <laughs> go do you copy this yeah not a problem keep it quiet yeah let's have a look though and they used to find it funny because they knew everything that was going on absolutely everything so I used to do these and um, the head of art at the time, he encouraged me as well to keep going and so on. But there's a pattern here of this kind of very stylized work. And of course, I've never really had that opportunity to really work with, with colour in a way that perhaps people who've studied art formally would. And the colour theory and things, I've got a basic understanding of it. Uh, I know what colours I like, but 
I think because I've not had that formal kind of art education, that there's something in the back of my mind still that doubts me, doubts my ability, um, doubts that, you know, I can see in the face of evidence that like my colouring books are popular and that's fab. And the style of art I do, that simplified drawing or the whimsical, the more abstract, really suits that. Um, and I'm able to express myself that way. But when it comes to other things, I don't know. The, I, the evidence is there and on my days when I'm really struggling, because I still do, I have bad days like everybody. You know, when I'm overly tired or um, perhaps unwell, I'll really start to think, well, why am I bothering to do this? And I just try to take a moment and say, hang on here. You know, why are you thinking like this now? Why, why is this something that's causing you an issue? And often it's, Angela, you're unwell. Let, let's, let's do something else for a bit. If I'm, if I'm doing art, I'll just put everything to one side and I'll go and do something else that day and take a break from it and wait until I'm feeling either physically well or I've had enough sleep so I feel emotionally better or it may be that I've had a you know a stressful time been out and about in the world around people too much and by people I don't mean crowds I mean a couple of people in a shop or at the pharmacy or wherever and um, It's, um, and then when I'm, I'm back to form, it's okay, I keep on going. But then I do try to do these other things, and I'm thinking, Angela, what are you doing? Like with watercolour. And, um, yeah. So, and I think the reason I've, that's why I struggle with colour, perhaps a little bit in some ways, is because I haven't had that formal education, training, or whatever. But then perhaps that's a strength as well. I mean, they do say you have to know the rules before you break them. Well, perhaps I've just skipped the whole of that. But it is that, but also it's that focus has been always on diagrams drawings without color so when i when i taught you know there wasn't anything like we didn't really have photocopies because they were far too expensive for schools you didn't and certainly not color photocopies they haven't been invented yet computers in schools good grief no it, it was quite a few years before you know anything other than the humble bbc b or bbc master was seen in a school let alone in um, and that was in computer science, let alone in any other department. Um, and in the offices, anything that was high tech, you know, photocopying was, was something you only did if you absolutely had to, because it was so expensive to do. And we used to do something called, um, if you needed copies of information, you had to use something called a bander machine, which was use spirit to transfer from like a carbon onto paper. And you could make, I don't know, 30 or 40 copies perhaps off one one of the carbons if you had done it correctly but you could get different colour carbons so I used to create worksheets or information sheets or whatever in different colours and diagrams in different colours but you were limited with the colours and you couldn't mix them and, and so on so <laughs> I'm talking about this so it was mostly in one colour, which with Banda was basically blue, because blue was the most common and cheapest version. The coloured ones were more expensive. And, and the other thing was, if you wanted Banda copies, you had to um, print them off yourself. They were, um, it was done with um, a machine, it was hand cranked. I don't think we had an electric one. Or did we? I think we did eventually. I think there was one somewhere, but it was the most popular one. So often you'd have to use one that that wasn't. And again, they weren't often done and used. And you didn't give the copies out to, to students. 
um, they were collected back in and reused and kept for as long as possible because they were expensive. Expensive not just in, in materials, but they were, they were expensive in, in time, as it used to take a long time to create. And in those days, people used to, you know, their, their notebooks were filled with notes that would be copied from the board, diagrams that would be copied from a, a chalkboard, because um, there weren't whiteboards then. And um, and so though you could have you know different coloured chalks, some showed up better than others, and it depended on the state of the, the whiteboard you were using. I had one of these rolly ones in my room, and it was a nightmare because the surface was quite slick and you know um, shiny. That it really did not work all that well. So, um, you know, black and white drawing was the thing. And over the years, looking back now as I'm talking, yeah, I dabbled with colour all through my, you know, life. So for some reason, even though my mother would, my mother and others would tell me I was absolutely useless at art, they insisted on buying me arty, crafty things. I suppose it's because girls didn't have Lego. Oh yeah. I used to play with my brother's Lego, but I get told off for it. Girls don't play with that. It's for boys. So I used to do it when there was nobody around to tell me that. <laughs> Not that I was ever very good at building anything with Lego, because I think I used to have very little time to be able to do anything like that. So, um, yeah, so I used to have these things and with colour and it used to be a bit of a you know a mare for me even then trying to get colours that I would like to work together I do remember having a set of felt tip pens oh my gosh yes felt tip pens and a colouring book it was a clangers colouring book do you know what I can see it now I can remember the smell in my room at the time. It was summer. It must have been for my birthday. Um, and these were my pride, prized possessions because I loved the Clangers. If you don't know what the Clangers is, it was a children's television programme over here in the UK. And they were knitted soft toys of these little pink creatures with long noses that lived on a, on a moon in space, an alien. And they they spoke in whistles and there were all these other lovely characters like the iron chicken the froglets the music trees the small blue moon and you know and they were just charming little stories and i loved the clangers because you know they were it was different i think it was oliver postgate as well small films and um they did a reboot of them a remake of them um a few years ago I've never watched the, the, the new versions, but I think somewhere in my DVD collection, I think I may have the clangers there. There's a, you know, they, they were made available, you know, the old original series were made available on DVD at one time, and well, I couldn't resist, could I? Last of the past, back to childhood. So. So yeah, so most of my arty stuff has either been, you know, in relation to science and education, has always been either very technical, like drawing like statistical map, uh, maps, statistical charts and so on, or um, graphs, and then illustration, I suppose scientific illustration, scientific diagrams, all in black and white. Or with very simple colour to, you know, so if you were doing a, a particular graph, say a, a bar graph, the bars, you would be allowed to use colour for the bars or preferably um, different patterns of black. So you get different shades of black, so various kinds of cross hatching and, and so on. So as I think about it, it's not unsurprising that I do have a bit of an issue with colour. But how much I enjoy just black and white drawing. 
and I every now and again I have this thing where I try out colour, try out colour mediums and end up going why did you Angela? Angela why? Why? What was going through your head here? And the answer is fluff. I hope that a few weeks or a couple of months further down the line or a couple of days something will have clicked. Nope. No, it doesn't. But still, I persevere. I, yeah, on the screen here, this looks incredibly vibrant. It's not quite so much here on the paper. The colours look incredibly vibrant there. Not that vibrant, honest. Um, I'll take I might take a photograph today of, of this to put on my blog rather than scanning the scanning <clears throat> as well does weird things to colors it either washes them out or intensifies them in some way I don't want red oxide for goodness sakes um, so as I talk about this I can I can see the connections of where things have <coughs> excuse me, of where I guess my style has come from. And is that observation of shapes and patterns and um, taking apart things. So like if you do a, an, an illustration or a drawing, a diagram of a particular flower, um, obviously you've picked it and brought it back to the lab then it's not just the whole flower you draw but you take apart the flower you know a, um, a petal at a time and you draw what's underneath the petals you draw the petals um, from different different viewpoints you then um, take the the stamen from the center of the flower you draw the stamen using a microscope um, or a hand lens if you have to see the stamen more clearly. Then you take the stamen off. So you're left with um, the pistil and the ovary so that you draw those. And then you will cut those in half to see what is inside using a microscope and draw what is inside. And then you have the sepals and the stem and the leaves all to be drawn. So you end up with an overview of the, the flower and then a whole series of images showing the different parts labelled and if you can, what's inside them, what they look like and, and so on. And that aids in identification generally or in understanding, um, understanding them. And I used to really, really, really love doing that. All black and white though. I can remember being told off for using colour in one. Because you're not supposed to use colour apparently. And my answer was, well, how do you get across what colour it is? You describe it. Describe it how? In words. Yes, but, you know, I used to get told off for my flowery... Um, descriptions of colours and um, flowery no pun intended but things like it'd be light blue dark blue or blue but no that's turquoise no it's blue no it's turquoise no it, scientifically that is blue but it's not it's but scientifically it is and I just ignored the in, instructions and advice and never lost me any marks because I think they realised they it was they were fighting a losing battle with me on that on those kinds of issues. But um you know, it's the nature of science. Science is what it is. And I was always always have been, and no doubt always will be, quite wordy in the way I, I write and speak. I mean I I couldn't see the issue. I thought, well, you know, we're we're calling some of these things we're describing quite well in Callum, but you can't say this one's more of a turquoise than a blue. I can't put a you know a colour swatch here to show what colour it is. No. 
Why not? Because that's not how scientific writing is done. But perhaps it should be. It'd be more interesting. I got nowhere. How I ever had the guts to speak up about things, I don't know, but I did. Because, uh... That was me. So, um... Yeah. So as I think about it now, and make these connections, I can see why using colour perhaps has always been a bit of an issue. There's a lot of things going on there, a lot of things to unpack. And um, there's a lot of frustration, I think, when I do come to use colour. Because it's that scientist in me wants it to be an accurate representation of what I can see. I need to use these colours. Whereas allowing yourself to kind of interpret it or go with a paler colour and perhaps different colours to represent different, you know, shadows or whatever, it's quite hard for me to do. And I think that's why I get so frustrated. And I just can't seem to break that kind of... Um, way of thinking or I haven't been able to in the past because I don't think I've made that connection before and yet with abstract work and particularly if I use limited colour palette like this it seems to mostly work for me because it's not meant to represent anything and the colours are just the colours that I want to use at this particular time And that seems to work. This seems to work for me. So it's not it's not simple, is it? No. Our past does influence our present. And if we're not aware of where these limitations or these past lessons, past experiences, what they are and how they've influenced us in the here and now, and sometimes aiding and sometimes hindering. It's not always that easy to overcome things. And sometimes, is it necessary to? I think, I think it's because I would like to be able to work with colour in the way I see other artists do and to be able to get that kind of um, you know to work with watercolours or you know, these, ink, these ink tents pencils are fab because the colours are amazing once you've activated them with water so there's a bit of magic going on as the colours brighten up and flow and mix with one another and I do love that I really do um, but but then would it really be me? Is that really how I express myself artistically? And the answer is most probably no. I enjoy the observations that I can make. I mean, all of this here, I think, again, as I was talking about how some of my early sort of like experiments with um, drawing were of things in 2018, like robots and so on, and spaceships or you know, what have you, not the people, not the people. And that, you know, that explains why I'm not interested in Never been interested in drawing people particularly. I said before I did do some life drawing and that was fun. But it really wasn't my kind of thing either. But I do pay attention. To tiny patterns and shapes and things. 
and I tend to, if I go out, um, say, you know, to a, a church or something like that, an old church, then I don't draw the church as a whole. I'll pick up bits and pieces that interest me and put them together in a way that tells a story both of my my visit to the church, I think, but also the things things that attracted my attention. And so it's it's that kind of a very personal record and response. It's not sitting down and painting the whole of the church or the building, although sometimes a small sketch of that might, you know, creep in, but not very often. But these, all these shapes and patterns have come because I've been spending some time I've been looking at things like um, for years at my own and Inca art and they they're things that really I find really intriguing the lines the shapes the curves and, and so on and um, the patterns the signs in them and so I think some of these have found their way into my my visual my inner visual dictionary if you like as well as my physical one but more to do with with that and they they flow out from time to time in in pieces of work but a lot of it as well is that of late um i have been looking at star wars encyclopedias or visual dictionaries things like that particularly of um, the vehicles and you know um, droids and um, architecture and when I watch the films that's what I'm paying attention to is the detail that's there in the background and the shapes and patterns and I think these things are just finding their way into my artistic consciousness <laughs> or you know flowing out from it that awareness but in a way that's perhaps a bit different. I love my fish. I do have to say, I love the, the weird fish I did. Um, they're a starting point perhaps for future things in the future because they, they were a lot of, they just appeared on paper and using all of this kind of thing. So they're kind of weirdly mechanical, but not in a steampunk kind of way, you know, it's more in an, an Angela kind of way, which is fine by me. But um, so this interest, as I was saying, right back from childhood, or no, more like teenagerhood because I was a teenager when it, 2000 AD started and you know it was had for years and years and years you know, the num and the, my brothers would never throw out any of their copies of 2000 AD and of course I used to read them as well because I did much to tut tutting I mean I outgrew things like Bunty and Jackie very early on they were never of much interest to me anyway. Um, I couldn't be doing with hair and makeup and all of the other stuff that started appearing. I sound like I'm not a girly girl, but actually I am. But it's not something I talk about, it's something I do. And I'm not interested in reading about such things or gossip and what have you. It's never had any interest for me, particularly. But, um,. You know, I progressed to um, things like the NME and New Scientist. NME, New Musical Express, um, music, paper weekly, a weekly music magazine paper. It was a paper printed like a, a tabloid paper. I, I'm sure it still exists, but um, again, I outgrew that, but, um, or perhaps just moved on. But... Um, I just think this interest in things that are futuristic or um, but then there's also that um, 
that call to the past as well of the ancient old churches and ancient places. And that, that's what interests me in some ways about Star Wars and also Lord of the Rings and other films is seeing where influences come from for architecture and design of things like jewellery and so on. And, and the same in Star Wars. It's um, quite surprising where influence influences have come from. You can see the brutalist architecture of the post Second World War in Star Wars, particularly with the Sith, who really does suit them. Um, brutalist, yeah. But other aspects, you know, the um, rounded domes in on Naboo and arches and so on are very reminiscent of, I suppose, Romanesque or um, sometimes those Greek, the little Greek buildings on the islands of Kos and others there, the blue and white, the blue roofs, white walls, absolutely beautiful. And seeing those kinds of things and where that kind of inspiration has come from is just interesting and will always be to me. So, and what's something interesting is that you know models in Star Wars and other other things of spaceships and so on are often made with things called greeblies, and greeblies are sort of like it's made from spurs and extra parts of. Um, models like airfix models my brothers used to do those as well and um, you're left with all these spurs and pieces and they've got really fascinating shapes and patterns on them often and they were often used to and incorporated into the models um, of starships and so on on and, and transport on star wars and no about no doubt dro droids and other things as well just as an aside yes i watch adam savage on um, he's tested on YouTube. It's fascinating. Again, skills that I, I'm not going to have. Um, I know my limitations because, yes, I tried making models and I was really useless. But I was always the one who was asked to paint the models after they were put together by my brothers because whereas they'd slap on the, you know, the base coats, the fiddly stuff, they go, Ange, can you do this for us? Okay, yeah. And off I go and do it. So it's funny how different, you know, I have different skills for different things. Well, you know, it's interesting. So I think back and see all of these kinds of influences and so on. You know, my love of seashores and shells and things is from spending a lot of time um, at Southern Down and Ogmore and Nash Point, which are parts of the um, South Wales Heritage Coast here. It's all very carboniferous, limestone and ammonites and lovely things, although some dinosaurs have been found or evidence of dinosaurs have been found just a bit further east along the coast of Sully, um, but I am just spending time in, in rock falls and looking at the cliffs and the rocks and I used to climb up the very unsafe cliffs to, ca to gather fossils at Southern Down. Uh, definitely not advised, it's sort of like the um, not high up, but high up enough, or hang over the top to get the fossils from the upper layers, which are different to the ones at the lower layers. Which time evolution, um, or change in species that existed at that time, climate change, whatever. Um, can't remember because, of course, most of South Wales is. The upper, lay, upper rock layers are carboniferous. You know, it's all the huge coal reserves that were here underground. And the coal that made Wales famous around the world for its steam coal 
the really good high quality that was brilliant in steam engines so um yeah all long gone well both the coal were removed but the mining industry that was still very active when we moved here in the late 60s. It's actually something I did my PhD on was coal. So, and ironically at a time when the, the mines were beginning to close. And, but, The research was funded by um, what was then the Science and Engineering Research Council, I don't know what it is now, but supported by the Coal Board, the National Coal Board, as it was at the time. Of course now, just a piece of academic research because we are moving away from fossil fuels, which is a good thing because what reserves we had should be kept for the important things, not just being burnt, because so many important materials are made from them. Pharmaceuticals, for example, and materials that would be you could make in other ways, perhaps, but would be a lot more difficult. So um, ingenuity is going to be needed in the future, not already. My job is really to try and remember what I've written on about today, about how a lot of my, my artistic style is influenced by how I've always worked artistically, in a way, which is that, in a way, a, a very stylized kind of um, work that was needed for... Um, the way scientific papers were done back in the day when I was doing them, all black and white, very had to be very clear. You'd get infographics in, you know, popular magazines perhaps, but not the kinds we have today. And um, there's still a lot of black and white drawing then, you know, illustrations, diagrams, graphs, and so on. And in the scientific journals, it was definitely all black and white, very, very clear. And clarity. It's all about clarity of communication, making sure that people really understood what you were saying and making it, making it so that people knew exactly what you've done and how you've done it. So I think I really do need to start trying to accept what I do as being as equally valid as anybody else, artistically or creatively, and honour my background as well, perhaps, in art and um, science and observations and everything else. So that's why I'm going to stop for today, because it's an hour just about and um, thank you if you stuck with me through this listening to me ramble on about my past and influences and experiences about of art that shaped where I am today hope you've enjoyed it that it's not too much hope you're enjoying seeing this come to color to life with color um, if you've stayed through and you hear this please consider giving me a thumbs up if you've enjoyed enjoyed this video be much appreciated if you haven't subscribed please do and come back and visit again um, it's always nice to communicate with people I think and share which is you know the main thing hope I've inspired you in some way I've hoped you make helps in some ways to make sense of artistic styles and influences and that it's not always the traditional routes that people go down but enjoy the rest of your day week however long it is until you return and I look forward to seeing you here again. Once again thank you. Take care now. Bye bye.